So welcome to the fourth lecture of the 25th annual The Fever Winter Series on Aging. And I'm your host, Elena Volpi. And the lecture series features national and internationally renowned speakers who focus on topics relevant to aging and geriatrics. The series honors the memory of Dr. Edward Lefebvre, who was a UTMB professor of medicine and was a strong proponent of elder care uh, and the study of aging at a time where uh, only few doctors were prepared to care for older patients. Uh, right before he died, a UTMB established the Division of Geriatrics, which is carrying on with his medical legacy. And after his death, his family and friends endowed this lecture series in the City Center on Aging to honor his memory. So today I'm really delighted to introduce a good friend and a collaborator from Los Angeles, Dr. Devin Rubin. Dr. Rubin is the Archstone Foundation Endowed Chair in Geriatrics, the Director of the Multicampus Program in Geriatric Medicine and Gerontology, the Division Chief of Geriatrics, and a Professor of Medicine in the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in Los Angeles. So Dr. Rubin, a little bit of history about him, earned his uh, bachelor's and medical degrees from Emory University in Atlanta. And he did his internship and residency in internal medicine, uh, medicine at the Rhode Island Hospital in Providence. And then he started his academic career at Brown University in Rhode Island. And uh, initially as an instructor and then as an assistant professor. And then I decided to go on a sabbatical to UCLA to actually do a fellowship in geriatrics. And after that fellowship, I guess UCLA grabbed him back and took him to the other coast of the, to the west coast of the United States, and he's been there ever since. Um, so uh, he, uh, at UCLA, uh, he's, he's had a, an incredibly productive career in geriatrics. Um, so his highly impactful research in geriatric care has been funded for more than 30 years by the NIH and several other um, federal agency, and he's generated about 200 peer-reviewed papers. His findings have been widely uh, translated in clinical practice, and is also a great geriatrician. He's a geriatrician for the stars, but he can't talk about that. So, um, for example, uh, Dr. Rubin has developed the uh, famous UCLA dementia uh, care model, which has been already implemented by several healthcare systems and is now being tested in a, a pragmatic national clinical trial of which he's the principal investigator. And we're one of the clinical sites collaborating with him, which is called a dementia care study or daycare for friends and family. Um, to which uh, uh, we are, as I said, we're, we're participating. He's also one of the principal investigators of the STRIDE study, which some people in this room may have uh, heard about, which is a study uh, on fall prevention. It's ended and now is going to be releasing the, the data very soon. Um, Dr. Rubin has also written um, many, uh, uh, many books, including about more than 40, I believe, um, among which Geriatrics at Your Fingertip, which is essentially the Bible of the geriatrician, which I think is at a 21st published edition. He served as a major uh, expert in geriatrics in many advisory panels for the National Institutes of Health, the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, the National Research Council, the Association of Directors of Geriatric Academic, uh, academic Programs, and the, um, uh, the American Board of Internal Medicine. He has also served as uh, the president of the American Geriatric Society. So in synthesis, Dr. Rubin is the science of geriatric made person. Oh, and by the way, he's written several poems, book, theater plays, and films as well. So he's a true Renaissance man. So. Today we're really lucky to have him here and he will to talk about healthcare of older adults, time to think different. So please join me to welcome Dr. David Rubin. So uh, the first thing I want to say is that the, the person that Dr. Volpe in introduced couldn't make it today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm sitting, he, he's very old and, and very beat up. 
so I'm actually pinch hitting for him. Okay, so we're going to talk about healthcare of older persons. Uh, time to think different. So, does anybody know what the difference is between thinking different and thinking differently? They are different. So, <laughs> so thinking differently is about how you conceptualize something. So I, I remember seeing a lecture where they showed uh, um, coronary angiograms of, of men and women with heart disease. And men had these little kinks like this, and women had these long rat tail lesions, and I never thought about heart disease di the same way again. So I think differently about heart disease. But thinking different is about seeing something that looks different on the horizon. It's a product. And uh, some of you may remember that a number of years ago, uh, Apple used that as a campaign. So if we get lucky here. This is what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about older people, the older population, from a little bit of a different perspective. I'm going to talk about population health, and I've met with several people today who, who uh, are really experts in population health. I, I'm a dabbler. Uh, I'm going to talk about something that I like to call practice redesign, and that's about how we changing we, how we care for people. And I'll give you a couple of examples. And then we'll have a, a, a reprise of Population Health. One of my favorite albums is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, so I wanted to have a reprise for it. All right, so older, older Americans, and these are pretty uh, recent data uh, for the most part. Um, there are about 51 million of us, older people 65 years of age or older, and that uh, accounts for about 16% uh, of the population. Now, just to put this into perspective a bit, is that by 2030, not that far away, uh, 70 million of us baby movers will have all marched through to reaching the age of 65. And that number will go from 15.6% to about 20%, about one in five. And, and it's, having those kind of numbers really don't help very much. But has anyone here ever been Florida? Yeah. Are, are there a lot of older people in Florida? Yeah. 19.6% of Floridians are 65 years of age or older, which means that in 2030, the entire country is going to look like Florida. <laughs> That's what we're going to look like. So uh, about... Uh, about a quarter are ethnic minorities. I'm certain uh, here in Galveston, it's a little higher. In California, it's about 50%. In Los Angeles, it's about 50%. Um, but that, that also means that 75% are not ethnic minorities. And 9 uh, to 14% live in poverty, which means that 84, uh, 86 to 91% don't live in poverty. And 21% and 34% of women live alone, but the vast majority don't live alone. 24% of men and 16% of women are still in the workforce, including me. And 62% have more, uh, two or more chronic conditions, like high blood pressure, osteoarthritis, et cetera. But that means 38% don't. 38% don't have two conditions. And similarly with functional impairment, although 14% um, uh, have impairment in what they call instrumental activities of daily living, which is the ability to uh, maintain a household, shopping, paying bills, doing, uh, uh, doing housekeeping work, those kind of things. But 86% are independent. Um, and 8% uh, require help with bathing, dressing, toileting, things like that. But the vast, vast majority aren't. And even with caregiving, uh, only 4% are people who need a caregiver in the younger group, and only 20% if they're over 85. So the bottom line here is that older people are a remarkably diverse group. And typically, when we teach geriatrics and in our clinics, we think about frail older people. 
that frail older people are not the majority. So that leads up to us thinking about population health. And this is an old definition, but it talks about the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of, of outcomes within the group. Now, the population can be anything. It can be the island of, of Galveston. It can be the state of Texas. It can be the United States. You define the population. But as a clinician, and in a lot of my work, defines the, uh, defines the population as people in our health system. Okay? That's our population. Now, once you have this idea of a population, there is this pyramid, and somebody showed this to me, somebody from our population health showed me this pyramid, and it, the pyramid had changed my life. Because you realize it doesn't matter what metric or what measure you use, whether it be cost, utilization, dis, disease severity, or disability, you will have a distribution of the top 1%, 2 to 5%, 6 to 20%, 21 to 60%, and 61 to uh, 100%. And the needs and the disability and the problems will go along the spectrum of population health. We will get to that in a few moments. So when you're thinking about doing population-based interventions, uh, a rubric I like to use a lot um, is, uh, is the uh, Donabedian model of structure, process, and outcomes. So um, structure are the are the things that you have in place. Okay. So structure, if you're going to care for a population of older people who might need surgery, uh, you're going to want to have a, um, an operating room. That's a structure. Process is that you're going to want to have procedures so that people who are in that operating room don't get infected. And outcomes uh, are you know, the, the, the good surgeries and that, that happen. So um, there is a, uh, the other analogy I like to use is the race analogy for fires. Okay? And I have really trouble with acronyms because I can remember the acronyms, but I can't remember what they stand for. So race is the one uh, which is rescue, alarm, confine, and evacuate or uh, um, uh, extinguish. Yeah, good, thank you. So I, I actually had to go on the internet this morning and, and pull these all down. But, but the point of the matter is, if you, those, are, um, those are the processes. So for, for fire prevention, you want to have fire houses and fire engines, and you want to have fire hydrants and those things. But these race items are the processes of care. And in healthcare, most of the processes of care are things that doctors do, they either order, uh, or, or nurse practitioners or surgeons. And then the outcomes uh, for fall, for, um, for fires, is you want to preserve houses. You want to preserve houses. And in, in healthcare, it's, it's preserving dignity or preserving life, but there can be many different outcomes. Uh, about, uh, oh geez, a decade or so ago, uh, CMS, which is, is the uh, uh, agency that is responsible for Medicare and paying for healthcare, established four um, aims, actually three aims, and one was added more recently. Better care, so that really relates to structure and process, so the quality of care being better. The second is better health, and that's the outcomes of care being better. And the third, which we kind of never used to think about, but we think about a lot now, is lower costs. So uh, Medicare, as an insurance company, wants to get a good value. They want to get a good buy. And more recently, because trying to achieve these three outcomes, three aims, was killing doctors, uh, they added a more recent one called the quadruple aim, uh, which was to provider satisfaction. So we're going to transition to, to a practice redesign. And this combines interventions aimed at structure and process to achieve better outcomes. It attempts to improve quality or uh, increase efficiency by one of three ways. Either fixing a problem or an inefficiency in healthcare, exploiting technology, 
or using different people or people differently. So fixing an inefficiency. Um, the first principle of this is delegating data collection. So this is a slide, I, it's a very old slide, I made it many years ago, um, but it's, it's kind of like a Zagrit guide, it's a, it's a target. So in the center, in the, the, it has four dollar signs, okay? Because that time when the doctor and the patient are in the room together is the most expensive time. And that's typically because the doctor is the most expensive, most highly paid employee in the office. Um, so that time really needs to be the kind of quality time. The second circle is the orange circle, and that is what happens in the office visit that is done by other people. The medical assistants, the check-in people, the, um, the, the nurses, et cetera. And that has $2 signs because it's less expensive. Um, and then the third is out of office. What uh, patients can do out of office, and we'll talk about we visit questionnaires and things like that, but that's that's very expensive. That's very inexpensive. So I have a dollar sign there, but it, it probably, since the postage stamp is still only about fifty cents or so, it, it could be a, a cent sign. Now the principle of, of practice redesign, one of the principles about delegation, is to increase the um, to reduce the time spent in that inner circle, but improve the quality. So this is like you know quality time with your kids. You may not have a lot of it, but you want it to be really good, and you don't want it to be uh, infringed upon by other things. And then always push to the outermost possible circle when possible. So if it's something that somebody else can do as well as you, and they make less, delegate it to them. Delegate it to them. And, uh, and they, they, when I went to some courses in business school, they talked about delegation. You want to you want to delegate to people who can do the job better than you can, and and that's why God invented surgeons because these hands would be very destructive. So, <laughs> so uh, what I do is I delegate to somebody who could do that. And a cardiologist. You know, uh, I just admitted somebody this afternoon for a, for a colonoscopy, and you don't want me doing your colonoscopy. Uh, trust me. Trust me. So you delegate to somebody who can do the job better than you can. You, do, you delegate to people who, um, who can do the job as well as you can. So I'm actually here in Galveston. The patient is being admitted to the hospital in Santa Monica. One of the things I did this afternoon is I emailed my partner who's going to be taking care of the patient and explained what was going on. And I have complete confidence that she's going to be able to handle it. Except I'm not sure she's going to be able to handle the daughter. <laughs> Um, and then the third kind of person you delegate to is somebody who can't do the job as well as you. Huh? This is medicine. This is medicine. You know, you're delegating to somebody who is taking somebody's in life's hands and can't do it as well as you. But in fact, we do this all the time in medicine. We have residents and fellows and medical students who do a lot of this, and we oversee them. And the sim same thing can be done in other parts of healthcare. And there's some things that you don't want to delegate, but many things you can. So we delegate, the first uh, group of uh, folks we want to delegate to are patients. And it's really great to, develop, uh, to dedicate, to delegate to patients is because they, they frequently have a fair amount of time on their hand. But more important, they have a lot of skin in the game. After all, it's their lives. So we delegate, we have a, a pre-visit questionnaire uh, that is 18 pages, but it's very geriatric friendly. It moves pretty quickly, and it's free. We can, we can have it. Um, and it goes through past medical history, the hospitalizations, the meds, the allergies, social and family histories, functional status, advanced directives, healthcare maintenance, all the geriatric syndromes. And it probably takes them 30 to 45 minutes to complete. But that's 30 or 45 minutes that I don't have to fill that out and I can spend much more time on the patient's agenda. Okay. If I have an hour, and I feel very generous that I have an hour to do a new patient visit, I don't want to spend a half hour or 40 minutes of it obtaining data. 
So the second group of people you can delegate to are office staff. And you can uh, screening uh, for falls, for cognitive impairment, et cetera. Following up on triggers. If somebody hasn't had a fall, they can ask them additional questions about that. Uh, recording medications and allergies. And then I like to think about these enhanced vital signs. Uh, orthostatic blood pressure. That means when somebody's standing to make sure their blood pressure doesn't drop. It's something we always want to do when somebody falls. Uh, visual acuity testing. Uh, monofilament, which is uh, something we use with people who have diabetes. PHQ-9 is a depression screen. And uh, you actually follow people with depression, their symptoms, and patient education. So one of the things that we have in our practice, and I do this religiously, is I have a huddle before uh, I see patients in the afternoon. And we go, myself, my patient services representative, the nurse, and sometimes a care coordinator, all sit around together. We go over the entire patient list. And I'll say, well, this person had a recent fall. You know, I want the orthostatic blood pressure checked. This person's on antidepressants. I want a PHQ-9 checked. And so that, I'm, I'm delegating that. And uh, those huddles are great because everybody has a different set of information they bring to the table. So uh, we actually studied this. I had a resident who was interested in, in delegation. And uh, we looked at eight studies that have been co conducted uh, of, uh, that looked at quality of care, uh, particularly for falls, incontinence, uh, and dementia. And we, we, we sorted all of the um, processes of care into those that could be done and were done, uh, were delegated to um, nurse practitioners, to medical assistants or, or uh, LBNs. And what we found was that as these were delegated, there were progressively high pass rates for quality indicators. So if the docs did them themselves, they didn't do it as well. And I'll give you an example of that. So the, uh, we talked about this orthostatic blood pressure. So this is what happens is when people stand up, their blood pressure drops, and they fall. You know, it's, it, it's a problem. And we have spent, I spent years and years trying to tell doctors how important this was. And they said, yeah. They said, uh, we understand it. We get it. And uh, I said, you also, you know, we, we, uh, we uh, think that you can actually delegate this to someone, to like your medical assistant do this. And they, what they would say is, you know, my medical assistant is too busy. So I'll do it. So here you have somebody who's making seven times as much as the medical assistant taking on this work. And it turns out, their noses were growing because they said that they would do it and they didn't. They said they would do it and, and they actually, with you know, this intervention to try to train them and this and that, they went from doing it 7% of the time to 10% of the time. So it was the wrong person for doing the job. OK, next, uh, next practice redesign is exploiting technology. So the electronic health record, we could spend the next hour talking about the electronic health record. Uh, one of the poems I wrote that, uh, that my wife wouldn't let me send out uh, for publication uh, was uh, called The Clicks. And it was about the electronic health record and what it was doing to doctors. It was, it was um, to the rhythm of the Edgar Allan Poe, The Bells. It was called The Clicks. And in any event, um, uh, I have ranted about the electronic record uh, a lot, but there are some really good points to the electronic health record, and it's, it's, it's not going away, I'll just tell you that. So one of them is copy forward. Copy forward is actually taking your previous note, moving it forward, and, and editing it. Now the problem people get into is they move it forward and they don't clean it up. So what you have is, is, are myths and, and inaccuracies being perpetrated on and on and on. But the copy forward does save time. Reflex additional testing. This, uh, this is cool as well. So if I send a urine specimen and the urine specimen looks abnormal, they will send it off for a culture. And they do this automatically. So that's cool. That's cool. They, they, they do some thinking for us. Add-on testing. This is my true favorite. 
So what will happen is I'll order a test, uh, like a blood count, and the blood count will be low, and she's I want to order some more tests to find out why the person's got a low blood count, and I can add it to the existing specimen many of the times, so I don't have to bring the patient back in. And that is really great. Uh, reminders, uh, sometimes these are good. Kind of the first in do pretty well, and then people get reminder fatigue. Um, uh, um, other things, one thing called the ADT notification. So that's admission, discharge, and transfer. Uh, so that anytime one of my patients gets admitted to UCLA Hospital, I get a little note saying the patient was admitted. Uh, sometimes if they get admitted to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, I get a little note saying they were admitted. Um, so it's, it's, it's very valuable. There is also uh, the electronic health records. There's some movement that's coming out of Boston called Open Notes. And Open Notes is where patients actually not only have access to their electronic records, they can enter corrections and enter their own data into it. It's got some issues to it. Uh, but uh, it is something that has been somewhat successful. Uh, identifying and referring patients for treatments. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'm going to talk more about this. But the electronic record has a tremendous amount of capacity to examine what's in there, presuming it's accurate, and guiding care. We'll talk more about that. Uh, telehealth and remote uh, technology. Um, this has gotten mixed reviews, but I had, to re re I had to review the literature on this recently. And the reason why is because I was poo-pooing this. And somebody, somebody emailed me and said, you're out of your mind. So I, I did look at it again. And there, there is some effects in terms of diabetes and, and chronic pain, et cetera, where telehealth, in other words, communicating information through an iPhone or something like that, can actually be beneficial. Using different people. So uh, do people know what a scribe is? You guys have scribes here? So a scribe is uh, a person who typically is not uh, a professional at all. And frequently, these are college graduates who are waiting to get into medical school or, or do something else. And what they do is they, they transmit information from the doctor's mouth into the computer. Um, I, I went to a conference a number of years ago, Jesus, about eight years ago, and they were talking about how wonderful scribes were. And I, I said, why don't we just do voice recognition? It's, it, you know, we're almost there with that. And they said, no, these are, this is much better. So we, we replicated this as a pilot and actually studied it. So it would be, um, uh, I would come in with somebody who used to be my patient services representative and then became this physician partner, which was essentially a scribe. And it, it was a remarkable thing. We would come in shoulder to shoulder, and she would go to the computer, and I would go to a rolling chair, and I would go up to the patient, and I would start talking to the patient. She'd be doing this stuff. And she said, uh, I see you've seen the, uh, the oncologist recently. And she said, yes, uh, I heard you saw the oncologist recently. I said, Nikki, can you pull that up? It was already there, so I can look at that. But she would not let me touch the keyboard. <laughs> That's something I was not allowed to do. And she would finish up the note. She would send it to me. I'd make a few edits, and we would be done. Uh, it was actually a wonderful experiment. We, we did some formal testing. 20% uh, of the doctors who had this, this pilot would be willing to take a pay cut to have these, 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 um, these uh, scribes. Um, I had a, an amazing experience. Um, of a, of a Haitian of mine who was 91 years old. She was my healthiest patient. She was on no medicines. And then she turned yellow. She turned bright yellow. And sure enough, I got a CAT scan on her. She had a big mass in her pancreas. And uh, I brought her in to, to tell her the news. I mean, she was very stoic. Her husband had been sick uh, as well. And she always thought she, she would outlive him. And, probably wasn't going to happen. So she was very stoic and, 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 and you know, uh, stiff upper lip, etc. And then I left the room, and she and the scribe cried together. It was just an amazing moment. Uh, comprehensive care coordinators, and these are people who are kind of 
uh, at the uh, one step below a social worker. Um, for some reason, or another healthcare systems uh, are, don't always want to hire social workers for outpatient settings. They should, but they don't. Uh, community health workers uh, or promotories. Uh, and I'm saying dementia care assistance because that's, it relates to a program that we have that I'll tell you about in a few moments. But these are positions that just don't exist. They're not nurses. They're not social workers. They're newly created positions to fill new roles. OK, using uh, people differently. So I like to use the term co-management. And this is using two or more healthcare providers jointly to manage the patient's medical care to achieve the best quality and outcomes. So this might be for specific conditions. So I don't treat the cancer of any of my patients. I wouldn't think of it. I wouldn't think of it. So if a patient of mine has cancer, I care for the medical issues other than the cancer and the cancer person. Same thing with kidney, uh, chronic kidney disease, people who are on dialysis. I don't do the dialysis settings. So I co-manage with the patient. Uh, you can also do this for multiple conditions in coordinating care. One of my uh, colleagues developed something like this with nurses called guided care that was somewhat successful. It can be a physician specialist uh, combining with a physician uh, generalist, like a cardiologist with a general internal medicine or geriatrician. Or it can be another health professional physician. And that's what we're going to spend some time on. So some models here. Uh, this was a very interesting review article that looked at nurse management of, um, of uh, chronic conditions, not geriatrics conditions, but chronic conditions compared to doctors doing this by themselves. And what they found was that the nurses, when added to the team, it resulted in a 40% lower uh, glycohemoglobin, which is the measure of diabetes control. A 3.7 milliliter, uh, millimeter less lower blood pressure a 12.1 milligram per deciliter lower LDL. That's the, cholesterol, the, the bad cholesterol. So it works. And what we found also in, for geriatric conditions, the kinds of things that are our bread and butter, uh, for falls, incontinence, and, um, and dementia, what you see is the difference between a doctor doing it by her himself in co-managing with a nurse practitioner are tremendously improved quality of care. Tremendously improved quality of care. And so what do we mean by quality of care? So here's an example just from uh, for falls. A falls history performed. 45% if the doctor did it alone, not 89% if the doctor if the nurse practitioner was involved. And here we go, the orthostatic blood pressure, 7% versus 79%. And things like looking at home hazard evaluation, 8% when the doctor alone um, versus 82% for the nurse practitioner. So co-management is sounds very simple, but not always so. So uh, you have to select who is the target population, who you're really interested in co-managing, who are the right people in the right model. So for, uh, I'm going to give you a couple examples in a few moments. Uh, one is falls. And for falls, we thought that the uh, a registered nurse was the right level. And for dementia, we thought that a, uh, a nurse practitioner was the right model, the right person. And uh, there are reasons for these. And then the process of care for co-management. Assessment, developing a care plan. And typically, these co-management models will have a very um, discrete care plan. That's something we don't see. Doctors don't do that very much. It, it, a lot of it comes out of nursing, these care plans. But uh, in co-management, we do see that a lot. Uh, communicating with the primary care doc, monitoring, and then revising the plan as needed. So there are some challenges with this. It, one of it is the range of clinical problems. 
So let's say you're co-managing dementia, so I, I imagine, and somebody's falling. Whose jurisdiction is that? Is that the dementia care manager, or is that the primary care physician? And it's interesting, because we, we've been mounting these kind of programs for, for a number of years, and it depends upon who you ask. Some doctors would say, you manage the whole kit and caboodle, and the others would say, no, no, stick to your knitting. Order writing. So do the co-management doctors or nurses have the right to, uh, to uh, write orders? And so what we've done in, in one of our programs we, that uses nurse practitioners, they communicate with the primary care docs and say, uh, this is my recommendation to start this medicine, um, and gives them three choices. Yes, I agree. I will write it. Uh, uh, yes, I agree. Why don't you go ahead and write it? And uh, let me think about it. Or I don't agree. So who does write those orders? And then acute medical uh, clinical problems. So what happens in the middle of the night uh, if it's somebody gets short of breath or has a cough or has a fever or becomes confused? Do they call the, um, the co-management person or the primary care doc? Other challenges are communicating with the primary care physician. Most of the time, this is done through the electronic health record. Uh, with other health providers, some of that is within the healthcare system, but some of it may be outside the healthcare system. And as most of the people in the room know here, is that much of the health care of older people is not provided in healthcare systems. So things like adult day health, community-based exercise programs, things that are in the community, counseling, uh, private counseling, et cetera. So how do you communicate with those folks? And here things get a, a, a bit dicey because of uh, protected health information and firewalls. So it gets, it gets quite complicated. So these are challenges. So I'm going to talk about two uh, studies. And uh, the, the two studies are, are really cool because both of them were conducted in part in Galveston. UTMB with Dr. Volpe as the, uh, the, the psych principal investigator. So the first is what we call the STRIDE study. And this is about falls and serious falls related injury. And so the question here is, can redesigning medical practices and engaging patients to improve quality reduce serious falls related injuries? Uh, this was funded by uh, uh, an organization, um, an entity called BACORI which is not a government organization, but receives a lot of money from Medicare and from other uh, from health insurance and the National Institute on Aging. Uh, it is a, a cluster randomized superiority trial, and that is just jargon. What it means from, uh, from the perspective of everybody in this room, including me, is that we assigned matching practices. One practice got one intervention, the other practice got another. And this was large. This was 5,451 people uh, recruited across 86 practices at 10 sites over 20 months with 20 months of follow-up. Uh, the, the results have been analyzed. And if you want to come to Long Beach in, uh, in um, May, we will be presenting the findings of the study. And, and it will be submitted for publication as well. These are the 10 clinical sites. And you see. Right there, University of Texas. I didn't draw this, so if I put Galveston in the wrong place, let me know. Um, but they, they, there they are. And so who were these people? They were community-dwelling people who were 70 years of age or older. They all had some risk factor for falling and for having a serious falls-related injury. So that might have been that they either fall and hurt themselves in the past year, fallen two or more times in the past year, <coughs> or they're afraid of falling because of balance or gait problems. And what do we do with them? Uh, it was a false care manager who was a nurse, uh, who, whose roles were to conduct a risk assessment of, of risk factors. We'll get to that in a moment. And engage the patient in self-management. So many of, these, many of these things that we recommend to prevent falls are behavioral. 
getting people to do something different. Either start something good or stop something that's bad. So there's this whole, uh, this whole field of uh, self-management and motivational interviewing. Would the patient develop a falls injury prevention plan and then keeping the primary care doc in the loop is getting approval of this care plan. Uh, the falls care manager could directly implement some of these recommendations, but some needed to be implemented by the doc. And then monitor and support the progress. So these, these folks were, were providers. They were providing longitudinal continuous care. And let me just tell you, uh, I, I spent some time with these falls care managers, and they truly took ownership of their patients. Like, like, like me, they worried about their patients. So the risk factors we addressed are medication risks. So there's a whole group of drugs that are called falls risk increasing drugs, or FRIDs. And these are drugs like benzodiazepines, like Valium, or the Z drugs, uh, like Ambien, et cetera. Uh, and alcohol is another medication. So these are things that that increase the risk of somebody actually having a fall. Uh, postural hypotension, we talked about this, and the, dementia, the falls care managers did this, not the docs. Visual impairment, feet and footwear problems, are they wearing the wrong shoes, like high heels, um, which are generally the wrong shoes in this population. Osteoporosis, osteoporosis is not a risk factor for falling, but is a risk factor for sustaining a serious falls-related injury. And the most common was gait, strength, and balance disorders. So uh, when you think about uh, gait is whether they're kind of tripping over their feet, their balance, or they, if they get perturbed, are they going to go to ground rather than stay on their feet? And then strength. And strength are basically, uh, it's a little anatomy lesson, physiology lesson, the most important muscle in terms of not falling is, anybody know? Quadriceps. quadriceps. So quadriceps are really important. And then finally, home safety risks. So these are the seven risk factors. And then to form that care plan, the person who was at risk of having falls would identify one to three factors that they wanted to work on first. And then for each of these risk factors, next steps, the roles, responsibilities, and timeline were identified. The primary care uh, provider would approve, and then there's would be documented in the record. Okay. So uh, details on May 6th or 7th. Uh, the second is the UCLA Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program. This is a clinical program uh, that is designed to maximize patient, that means person living with dementia, function, independence, and dignity, minimize caregiver strain, and reduce unnecessary costs. This began in 2011, and the way it began was this, that one of my partner's patients and his wife, the, the wife had Alzheimer's disease, the guy was um, pretty wealthy. He was actually quite wealthy. And um, they had full-time caregivers, et cetera. But on a Friday afternoon, he would call me up at 5 o'clock and say, my wife's caregiver has to leave the country to take care of a relative. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> so so uh, I figured he, he thought that you know, since I was division chief, I could you know, make waters part or whatever. Obviously not. Um, as she was getting closer to her death, she, he said, I want to do something for patients with, like my wife. So what he did was he, he gave us a challenge. He said, you know, find something that you can do for these people. And we looked around, and there was a program in Indiana that was working in a safety net hospital that had developed a, uh, a, a dementia program. And it was, it was pretty successful. Now, it was in a safety net pro, uh, hospital and, and, and like there was no competition. I mean, it was a very different kind of environment. But it, it, it was a very good program. So we adapted that program, um, which we proposed to him. And, and he gave us a little money for that. 
But even better, he introduced to, to one of his friends who was much wealthier than he was, who gave us a million and a quarter over five years to get started. We were going to get started with 250 patients, and then we hit the lottery. So uh, in 2012, uh, Medicare, this was uh, under Obamacare, uh, developed this Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovations. And they had these challenge awards. Uh, one of my big mistakes, I made a lot of mistakes, but I should have asked for more money. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, um, they had this call, and we, we applied for it, and we were very fortunate. We got one of the first 26 grants. And that allowed us to expand the program from 250 to 1,000 patients. And as of, as of today, uh, we're over 2,800 and about 700 that are, are, are currently active. Uh, what happens with these people, uh, you know, this is now seven years. Uh, many of them pass away, about 10 to 15 percent pass each year. Uh, some of them move away, some go into nursing homes, and there's not much we can do for them. So the program approaches the patient as caregiver as a dyad. Our belief is that unless you address both the patient and the caregiver, you're not going to be able to help manage the patient. And recognizing that this is a long journey, there are no cures for Alzheimer's disease, despite what some people will tell you. And it provides comprehensive care that is based in the healthcare system but reaches out to the community, our community partners. So let me just tell you, UCLA and UTMB are never going to have an adult daycare program. And, and they shouldn't because, number one, it'll cost them three times as much to do it as in the community. And number two is they won't do it as well. So there's some things that are actually done much better in the community. So there are kind of two big models. One is the one that we have that, that, that starts in the health system and reaches out to the community. A second uh, model, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes, starts in the community and reaches into the healthcare system. But this one develops, uh, uses a co-management model with nurse practitioner dementia care specialist who does not assume primary care but works with the physicians to conduct in-person needs assessments. These are 90-minute assessments. Develop and implement individualized care plans. Monitors a response. And uh, we have access 24-7, 365 days a year. It doesn't mean the nurse practitioners are doing that, but they sign out on nights and weekends to the geriatrician. Uh, our community-based uh, organizations provide adult daycare, counseling, case management, legal and financial uh, advice, and workforce training. So what have we found with this? That the quality of care for dementia using, uh, doing chart abstractions is extremely high. This is based on 797 chart reviews and extremely high. It doesn't matter which nurse practitioner was involved. The doctors liked it. So this is nurse practitioners telling docs what to do or recommending what to do. And 61% said that they provided medical, valuable medical recommendations, 85% valuable behavioral relation, uh, recommendations, 68% said it improved the doctor-patient relationship, over half said it saved them time, and 90% would recommend other patients. And it turns out we have always had a waiting list after the first year or so. Uh, and the waiting list has gone up to as high as 400 people. We are having over a year. And, and right now, we're almost through the waiting list, and we have uh, are hiring another dementia care specialist. So what does this do for patients? Uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly. But uh, this orange, uh, let's start with the, the, the green line. So the green line is the mini mental state examination. And this is a test of cognition. Okay, this is shows you how much memory and other things have been lost. And sure enough, uh, as people are in the program for a year, their cognition gets worse. This drug, does, this uh, program does not cure dementia. And concomitantly, this is functional status in the, in the scale we use that higher is worse, they get worse. Okay. Does not cure dementia. However, 
Several things do improve. One is behavioral symptoms. That's the agitation, the irritability, um, the uh, not being able to sleep, uh, other behavioral disorders, and depressive symptoms in the, care, uh, in the patients. Moreover, uh, three um, measures of caregiver all improved. The first was distress from the behavioral symptoms that the patient was experiencing. The second was uh, this uh, instrument called the Caregiver Strain Index, which is an overall measure of how disruptive uh, caregiving is to your life. And the third is uh, something called the PHQ-9, which is a, a measure of depression, all improved in one year. And then for the triple aim, we looked at, uh, uh, these are two studies. One is published, the other is uh, waiting revisions. Uh, reduced hospitalizations about 12%, not statistically significant, but ED visits about 20% reduction, ICU days not statistically significant, but a, a decent reduction, hospital days by about a quarter. And we think that this might be because it's easier to discharge people because the dementia care specialists are going to pick up their care afterwards. Um, hospice use in the last six months. And you can argue that people who have Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, that many of them are ready for hospice. And 60% increase compared to people who don't receive it. Um, oops, gosh. Total uh, Medicare cost of care, uh, $2,400 less a year. This is what it saves Medicare. And nursing home placement, 40% reduction in nursing home placement. Which brings us to DCARE. So DCARE is the dementia care study that Dr. Volpe uh, alluded to. And this uh, is uh, two, actually two studies, one funded by Bacori, one funded by the National Institute on Aging. And it is designed to compare community-based dementia care, which is by social workers, for the most part, who are based at community-based organizations who do all of this on the telephone. And there's some good data to support that. The second is health system-based dementia care, which is based on the UCLA Alzheimer's Dementia Care Program, and compare both of those to usual care, which is basically um, uh, the Alzheimer's Association hotline, telling them how they can ac access that. These are our clinical trial sites. There are four, Geisinger in Pennsylvania, Wake Forest in North Carolina, Baylor Scott and White in uh, Temple, Texas, and uh, UTMB here. This is an 18-month uh, trial, and uh, we will. Uh, our plan is 2,100 people, 2,150 people. Uh, this is giving heartburn to uh, Dr. Volpe and the crew here, but the, these people have really been working very hard. So these are people. Uh, the people who are going to be in the study are community living. They can't start out in a nursing home or hospice. They have to have a diagnosis of dementia. This is not about drain training. This is not about preventing dementia. They have to have a friend or a family a caregiver, speaks English or Spanish, and have a partnering physician. And we're going to look at uh, behavioral symptoms um, in the person with, living with dementia and caregiver strain. And then there's a whole bunch of other outcomes. Now. Back to population health. Back to population health. This is that same uh, pyramid that I showed earlier, except it's filled in. And this is uh, our patient population at UCLA who has dementia. Okay. They've all been identified as having dementia. And it turns out that top 1%, 50 people, we have 5,000 people with dementia, so 50 people is that top 1%. They have, on average, 49 bed days per year, 4.8 ICU days and 4.7 emergency department visits. These people cost, on average, $186,000 a year, $186,000 a year. And then the second and third tiers, these are 2 to 5%. Uh, these people cost about $60,000 a year. These people cost about $20,000 a year. These people cost about 4,500 a year, 
And these people cost almost nothing. Almost nothing. So we have this population in the Alzheimer's and Dementia Care Program. Our sweet spot is probably these top three tiers because it's a pretty expensive program. And you wouldn't want to be a program that costs $1,200, $1,400 a year for somebody who's not incurring any health care costs. That would be wasteful. So what we did was we looked at these tiers and we said, what are the appropriate treatments for each of them? So for that top 1%, it would be referrals to something called the Extensivist Clinic. That's a small uh, patient panel clinic with more resources. Um, MVP program is a home visit program. The Alzheimer's and Dementia Care program. Referrals to palliative care. If somebody's having five hospitalizations a year and has dementia, you know, it's probably time to talk about goals of care and what, whether you know, these hospitalizations are achieving what people want. So if you take a look at each of these tiers, we have something identified. So the next step was to actually uh, operationalize this. And the way we did this is, first of all, create a registry. So the registry are all 500,000 people, and these are all confirmed by the primary care docs that they actually have dementia. And then to establish criteria for referral to either longitudinal care programs like the home visit program or the extensivist program or the Alzheimer's and dementia care program, or referrals for consultation, palliative care, uh, urogynecology for people, uh, particularly mostly women who have recurrent urinary tract infections, keep coming back to the hospital, and referring to pharmacists for people who are on 15 drugs or on drugs that have um, um, high anticholinergic properties. So what we've done for this is to establish uh, criteria for referral to each of these programs based on utilization, some exclusionary criteria, and inclusionary criteria. So what we are doing with this is, right now as we speak, um, are writing algorithms that are going to be embedded in the electronic health record and will prompt doctors based on the algorithm to say, are you interested? We, we think your patient would fit well with this resource. And then all you have to do is click like two or three clicks, and it's ordered. And it's ordered. So a few take home message uh, health care of older persons, one size can't fit all. We have a, a wonderful ACE unit similar to the ACE unit here. It's for very sick, frail, older people. But for younger, healthier adults, people who are outpatients, it doesn't help them very much. Population health approaches will be needed to ensure that all patients receive the right type of care and the right amount of care. Uh, Co-management programs are promising for chronic conditions that need a lot of attention. Physicians must be able to delegate and function as part of a team. Uh, we, we as doctors have been uh, rugged individualists, and we, we need to be much more teamy. And finally, uh, stay tuned. There's a lot more to be learned. Uh, there's a lot of results that are going to be coming out. And, and we are exceptionally grateful to be working with UTMB. It's, it's just been a pleasure. So the last slide is uh, thinking different to the uh, Apple campaign. And that's, that's kind of one of my heroes when I was a kid. So uh, I'm going to stop here, and if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to attempt to answer them. Thank you, guys. Yeah, oh, no. Let me run out of the room here. <laughs> so to start with Kierkegaard, you said, you know, we only understand life in retrospect, but we have to live life prospectively. Yeah, yeah. So how, and, and your 1% was retrospective. So do you have data on how well you predict, any, any prediction model? In other words, go back a year prior in those 1% and how well you can predict who's going to be in yeah. those top three tiers? So the answer is uh, uh, sort of. The, 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 the best predictor of future utilization is, is prior utilization. 
it's not great. It's, 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 it's not all that bad. I mean, there's some, several predictive models, and I can share those with you, that show that it is pretty good. What our population health people say, they talk about rising risk. So, and that's one of the reasons why we want to take people who are at levels four, three, and two, is to try to prevent them from going up to that top tier. Uh, and there are ways of maybe looking at that, is to see you know, how much the, top, the average of the top tier people, does that go down over time? Things like that. But um, yeah, the, uh, the future is hard to predict. My pleasure. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.